We'll go over to our next uh, presentation, Meta Programming in Erlang, by Max Nordlund. Hello. Welcome again, Max. And ah. this time you're not doing JavaScript, you're doing proper programming. Ha 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 ha. Ah, ah, <laughs> I saw what you did there about the module system. That's all I'm going to do. <laughs> so, anyway. we're going to hand over this one. Yes. And we hope it works as it did when we tried. Moment of truth there. <coughs> we'll see if it works and Bjorn or Max gets up and running. Ta -da. Lovely. Hello. <laughs> so I have no fancy presentation. I'm only going to do live coding and I hope you will give me many, many, many questions so this becomes an interactive session and not just like me having a monologue. Um, so, metaprogramming in Erlang. Well, let me start by uh, talking a bit about metaprogramming in C. Uh, in C you have a preprocessor. It works at the uh, text level, which means that it substitutes a for B, and it's very simple. This means that you can do all sorts of craziness, like uh, substitute an opening parenthesis, and it will be fine. You can substitute an opening quote to automatically uh, turn stuff into strings or whatever. Um, this is very cool, very, very nice, but it also comes with some caveats, like, uh, you know, accidentally quoting just parts of a string or like the rest of your source code. And that is why the Erlang preprocessor actually is based on the token level. So I'm gonna do this. Uh, let's see. Uh, that's do we have no yeah here's an example of an uh, extremely small um, token based uh, macro. It's called define. In this case we call it in and this is what it outputs. It outputs and Merlin in transform uh, calling some function in and then ends, ends with another and. And this is a very strange one so I can write something more uh, simple and probably useful. Maybe you just need some constant foo one two three. This is Pretty common if you have, you know, magical numbers in your code. Uh, you could also do a logging macro, for example. Maybe you have some for format and args format args. Uh, of course, that's not very very useful. So you can uh, maybe you want to add the name of, and line of the file first. You would do it like this, uh, and you would do something like s colon uh, c space. And here's a cool thing: if you actually, if you have uh, this is valid Erlang syntax, and what does it do? You might ask. Well, I'm glad you did. It uh, joins the strings. So if you have multiple string literals. Uh, next to each other like this, you only separate by the white space, they actually uh, get combined. That means that its format here is a uh, string constant, it will, be, it will be fine. You would call log above like this. Maybe I have uh, my message, uh, message, something like this. And this will be expanded to IO format um, S colon T space my message PN uh, file line message. Of course, this is kind of obnoxious way of writing a uh, list literal, but it works. Uh, file and line are magical built-in macros, 
and they expand to the current file and line. So this, for example, would probably be something like um, maybe include slash Merlin dot Merlin in so it's horel or something like that, and the line would be maybe what was it uh, nineteen something like that. Okay, very nice, you say. Yes, it is, until it isn't. <laughs> What's the problem with this? Well, it turns out that if you have a macro that is either based on text or, in this case, on tokens, it's not hygienic. And what do I mean about hygienics? It means that variables defined inside a macro gets uh, renamed so they don't um, interfere with the surrounding code or other other macro invocations. What do I mean by that? I'm just going to go into the Merlin. In, uh, this is like a sneak peek, by the way, but I thought it was fun. I needed some example code. So if I have a macro that looks, that defines some variable, for example, maybe I have I want to do maybe some sort of a search on expectation, so I expect uh, uh, a to be equal b, for example. I could do a equal b. This is fine, right? Whatever you put inside here, whatever tokens you put in this uh, space will be put here, right? So when you call this expect one, two, that becomes one equals two, or match one to two, which will fail. However, if you use some sort of expression like file, it will become file equals two. But if you do some other expression like file, file Erlang, like that, or something like that, that would become See where this is going, right? It's a pure substitution. There's nothing fancy going on. And this means that if you have something that introduces a variable, that would cause problems. So instead of having a here, maybe have foo equals b. And since foo is not part of something here, maybe have a plus b, so I actually use it. All sorts of fun stuff will happen. I'm going to go back to that. That becomes foo equals 1 plus 2, which means that if you do expect, I don't know, 3 plus 3 or 4, you get, and, sorry, like that. And what will happen is that this one will work. It will assign the value 3, 1 plus 2, to foo. But this one will fail because uh, 3 is not equal to 7. This will be a bad match because we do pattern matching on uh, bound variables. Right? If you were to do this in Elixir, uh, this would work because then this will be, it will be silent to really end. So th this is actually like this. In, in Elixir, this would, be, this would happen. They're all, all numbered, so you don't actually and then you use the pin operator, the hat in Swedish. Yeah. The hat operator, like that. Anyway, this is, of course, sad. We don't like this. Hygiene is, is, is nice. It's nice to, folks, keep your hygiene. It's good for you, right? But we can't do that. So what do we do? Well, we can take a look at how the actual assert macro from the standard library looks. So let me include it. Include lib stand uh, lib uh, include. Is it? Is it not? Hmm. <laughs> That was not good. Let me restart my language server and see if it becomes less sad. Yeah, this is how I restarted, by the way. Just kill it. It will 
uh, that will happen and then it will be fine again. So, <laughs> see, it's, it's all good now. Okay, let's try that again. Okay, like that. This is what the assert macro does. It does a bunch of like no assert debug stuff so you can turn it on and off. If you ignore that and look at the actual defined assert, it looks like this. This is a more of an interesting macro, right? Okay, what does it do? It does begin, end, okay. And then it has some function expression, fun expression, that it immediately invokes, also wrapped in an additional parenthesis. This looks weird. Of course, unless you come from JavaScript, because then you will Im immediately see that this is an immediately evoked function expression, which has been used for ages in order to give you a new variable scope. So back in the day when you included a script tag, or when you do include a script tag, uh, every time you wrote var my var equals something, it will be added to the global scope, which is sad. So you wrap it in a function because function has a there's function scope in uh, in Erlang and in JavaScript. And then all the variables get contained. But there's a there's a catch. If you substitute this directly, like if we go back uh, here, if you start to substitute something like this, you would end up with something like look looks like this. Fun. It does something. And right, and then you invoke it like this. However, if this gets substituted in the wrong way, then suddenly you might do this and you try to invoke whatever this happened to return. And this is why the assert macro in, in Erlang in OTP uses begin end because that prevents this issue. If you have end here and you have begin like this this will be invalid syntax and you will get a syntax error, a compile time error directly, right? You won't get a weird runtime error. Great. But why does it need a new variable scope? Hygiene, right? So what it does, let's make this big again. So what it does is it creates a new um, variable scope. This is a called sheep source of truth and I've for the longest time was, was like, why are they not just writing true? Because the compiler is actually smart enough to realize if a um, pattern can never be matched if you only have uh, literals. So again, oops. If you have a case that looks like this, true e, sorry, true of, true, you would get a compile time error for here because false can never be matched. It can see that this will always match here. Okay? And it will try to say that to you and say, hey, whoa, what's up? What are you doing? And when you do assertions, you usually have, uh, in tests, you usually have like example data, right? So you would have an actual literal that you want to match to something. And if that happens to be uh, too easy to figure out that it's wrong, you get that compile time error and your test won't actually run, but you get an error instead. This way, since the compiler can't, it's not smart enough to figure out that process alive self always returns true, you can do it like this and like trick the compiler to actually run the code. So you actually get a test error and not some random compile time error somewhere, um, with, which also looks weird because it's like in the middle of some macro expansion. Okay. Uh, and it just checks if it's okay or if it's not, and then it throws an assertion error, blah, 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 blah. Right. So let's go back to this. What happens if I define underscore underscore t outside when I use assert? Uh, Kids, don't actually do this, please. It's, it, it would make poor assert sad, but let's do it anyway. T equals false. Assert uh, 12 
equal that for. This will explode with a bad, uh, bad match. Oops. Oh, Yelp. Okay, sure. <laughs> Here. Because t is already bound to the value false. And even though these variables or bindings doesn't leak to the outside scope, the outside scope still leaks into a fun, right? Because it's a closure. And this is how you are able to refer to variables in the surrounding scope, right? Which is what you want with a fun, usually. You do a map and you want to refer to a variable like an argument in to do something or whatever. Very sad. Much sadness. So how do we solve this? Ah, parse transform. The ultimate tool, the ultimate foot gun, uh, also known as compiler plugins. Okay, so in Elixir, you get hygienic macros. You can break hygiene in a very specific way. You have the quote unquote macros, built in macros. You have all this nice stuff. We don't get that in Erlang, but we have parse transforms instead, which is way more powerful because you can literally transform anything to anything. It runs a function on the uh, AST, the abstract synthesis tree, on every module, right? Or every module that enables this parse transform. And if you put this in a global include, or if you put this in a global compile time option, you can run it on actually every module that you compile. Which is great, because that means you can do all sorts of fun stuff. For example, hygienic macros, or you can, or like you can generate unique uh, variable names that doesn't, uh, be because you can look at what variables are already defined and stuff like that, right? Of course, this is an excellent way of uh, making spooky action at a distance. You know, you write this code, but no, I will inject this completely other code. Ha ha! Right? The current largest use of this in production today in Erlang. It's in React, or actually it's from Basho, who wrote React before they went bankrupt. And that's called Logger. Logger is a logging library. Uh, I'm not going to go into exactly what it does, but uh, uh, you, you can read on the transforms on the readme, I think. Uh, the gist is that you can disable certain logging levels at compile time, if you wish to. So you can say, hey, Logger, I want to turn off everything compile time um, from info and below. And what happens is that it runs the parse transform of all your code. It will find all logger, colon, info, or whatever, right? All the logging uh, uh, calls, and then remove them, which is great, because then you don't pay anything for that, right? Uh, you can also have a macro that would do like case, uh, should I actually log this info level? Uh, true, yes, do the logging, false, actually do not, nothing, right? That would be a dynamic check. And this is something that the logger, the built-in uh, logging library does. Both, both are valid. Uh, and this is an example for why you would, run, would like to run a parse transform on every single module because you have login statement everywhere. Okay, enough talk. Talking is boring. Let's talk about parse transform. So parse transforms are cool. You get the forms, you get the compile options, you do stuff, it's great. L except it isn't, because the forms are a list of tuples, where the tuples look differently depending on, this, on the form, on the syntax. Uh, right. In Elixir, the syntax is much like the syntax nodes are much more uniform, which means that you can pattern match them e more easily. You can generalize more easily. Uh, they are of variable length tuples, which means that they are kind of obnoxious to handle. Uh, all of them have two things in common. The first is the name, like function, uh, operator, um, you know, stuff like that. Uh, case, if. The second is uh, the location, so line, line number, line, uh, sometimes line number and uh, column number, sometimes line number, column number, file, stuff like that. And then there is stuff. S 
some, like uh, uh, nil, which is this, for everyone who's not familiar with the, the internals. The empty list is actually nil, right? The start of every list is nil. And then you have cons all the way up. Uh, nil doesn't have anything because, again, it doesn't contain anything, right? So it's just a two tuple. Uh, others, like function, contains, uh, let's see, it's the name of the function, the RT, uh, the arguments, or like the cases, and each case contains uh, like the argument part here, it contains if it has uh, a guard, and then it contains the actual function body, you know, a bunch of stuff. So most people use a library. And the most popular library is called parse trans. Uh, I think it's the one Ulaga uses, I'm not sure. It's uh, pretty great if you want to do simple transforms. Um, it does some trickery using tuple to list and list to tuple, which means that that's how it generalizes on all of these forms, which means it's also future proof. And the way you do it is that you, uh, kind of like Merlin, which is going to show later, you send in your function uh, and the forms, and it just runs it on everything. And as long as the, the transformer ends in something continue, it will just continue, and it's fine, right? And then you can run, uh, return stuff like stop and return, you know, like stop execution at this point. And this means that you don't need to write a manual visitor pattern, pattern matching on all known syntax trees. Right. OK. But if you want to carry some state with you, say, I don't know, the currently bound variable names so that you can generate a new unique one and doesn't mess up the, the scope, right? Then you're out of luck. I think there's actually an implementation for this in parse trans, but it was not documented and it's a really long signature and I had no clue how it worked, but it's used by some other examples that they have. So I wrote my own. Uh, this one also tries to use more of the standard library. So in the meantime, from when parse trans was written, stuff has happened. Uh, one thing is something called MERL, which stands for Metaprogramming in Erlang, which is now part of the standard library since many years back. Uh, that is what uh, does, kind of does this. I have extended it a bit, but uh, the idea is that you have a macro. This parses all of this lovely syntax. And then you have some special stuff like have an underscore in order to like be able to pattern match on syntax trees. So you don't actually have to write the syntax tree by hand here. You can write in Erlang syntax, it will parse it and replace all of this with an actual like syntax tree to pattern match on. It's actually a bit more complicated than that, but it works, it's great. Um, what I have done is I have the QQ, it's just like this in vanilla Merl. What I added is that the uh, ability to do it in function clauses like this, because you can't do that uh, in, uh, in vanilla. Uh, implementation details, but that's just a thing. Anyway, so what I did was I wrote a library that allows you to do a transform while carrying some sort of state. And this is really nice. And for those uh, who are observant slash, you know, uh, really into function programming, you would see that this is actually a map fold, right? You do a map producing a new list while carrying a state, a fold over all this, right? But it's a deep map fold because I do it over recursion instruction. And in order for you to be able to splice in multiple nodes syntax node or remove one, it's actually also flattens as it walks through. So it's a deep flat map fold. Kind of. <laughs> a lot, but in practice, it's really nice. You, you would use this Merlin quote to get these nice things. You do some pattern matching on the syntax tree. You can choose which face, because you want, maybe you want to do it on the, while you do the visiting in, inwards, or on exit, right? Enter or exit. Um, so you can choose that. Uh, this is really nice for cleaning up state, for example, on the where you go exit, and then on enter is that you do something new. Um, 
it, not in this transform, but in other transforms, I have done it so that I would get all the variable names in this function, so I can generate new ones. I do that on the enter on the function, and then below is where I actually look for some, I don't know, some uh, maybe the, like the logger info call or something like that, and do something clever with that. But then I have all of that, and when I do exit on the function, I can clear all the variables, right? Because they are not relevant anymore until they are come to the next one. Stuff like that. Uh, errors are obnoxious. You need to return a very special form in order for that to work. You can just return error. It's, it's great. I think you can do this in parse trans as well. I'm not sure, uh, since I don't use it. But it makes it much, much easier to use, right? This is make it nice. And it builds on RL syntax, which is a library from the standard library that allows you to do stuff like copy position. And this figures out um, how to do this. Set position, right? Yeah. And it uh, figures out how to get the uh, uh, position, even if it's an error. Like this is this is how it's actually done. It has like this error, and then the position is in hidden inside something, and just obnoxious. So, using the functions, the wrapper function from L syntax makes it uh, much more foolproof. Um, and this is basically what this does. It uses Merl and it uses L syntax and L syntax lib to implement what parse trans does using a fancy tuple to list list to tuple trick. It gets position, and you do stuff, and you. I do some parsing in this case, and here I generate some new code, like that, splicing in uh, needle, high low. Yeah. Do some comparing. Yeah. Then how does this look like? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I wonder how many times I can do that. You know what's great about not having anyone here? Nobody can stop me from doing really terrible puns. Maybe. OK, I have two people here. <laughs> they might stop me. We would see. Uh, anyway. So I've defined a macro called in to implement the in operator as you would find in other languages. Uh, in Elixir, strongly inspired by Elixir, this allows you to write code like uh, foo bar when foo in comma b comma c. You basically want to do this because writing it, whoops, sorry, whoops, foo. Like when you would write this in vanilla Erlang, you have, would have to do this. Uh, whoops, sorry, man. I'm terrible tonight. Bar equals A or else. Bar equals B or else. Bar equals C. Right? This is what uh, the inner operator actually expands to. So, right? Nothing more. But the normal macro can't do that. This is too advanced. You can only substitute tokens. So what I do, if we go back to the beginning, if you remember, I change it to this. So what actually happens here is that this gets the question mark in gets replaced with this thing. Then I find this in my parse transform and turn it into this. Kind of funky, but it's, it's nice. Uh, let's see if I can remove all of this like that. Uh, this is our an example. Let's see if I can find. I should have it. Mm -hmm. Here be example here. In example point here. Yeah. So. You can ask the, the compiler to uh, run all the parts transform and then print out the source code so you can see what, what it looks like using the dash uh, uppercase E option. And this is, then you get a .e file. 
this is what I've done on the example above here. And what it looks like is this. You get some file, module, compile time stuff, blah, blah, blah. And then you can see what actually happens here, right? This here may be greeting in hello, 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 okay? Becomes when maybe greeting equals or else, or else. Just like you would here. Actually, it's in the reverse order, I guess, because I'm using some sort of list reverse thing that usually happens when you do a map by hand. Um, and then you have this where I use a range instead that uses the dot dot operator because I wanted to see if I could do that. And it gets this and also in less than 10. This is stuff you can do. You can do more advanced stuff as well. Uh, let's see if I can maybe see the with statement example. You can also implement cool stuff like the with statement from, again, from Elixir, because I like Elixir. With stuff, do some pattern matching. Here I have some, something that looks a bit like a monad, right? Of course, there's not actually the syntax in Erlang, right? So I had to cheat a bit. This syntax comes from uh, list comprehension. So you do this list comprehension that looks funky up here, and then I can transform this into something useful. So if you look at the complex examples, maybe even easier to see what it does. It does one arrow here, it does another arrow here. Here it also checks a when, sorry, um, a guard expression of, and here I map on the success cases, else here I uh, match on the uh, error cases. So in case, for example, status is not less than 300, for example, 404, I match on that. That would come from here, for example. Right? And then, of course, this has to be disjugged somehow, so it becomes, let's see, complex. It becomes this lovely nested case of cases of cases of doom here. And here you can see also my secret variables where which I have generated one, two, three, one, six, eight, you know, stuff like that. Of course, this is not code you would like to write, but it's correct. Like it does what you want it to do, semantically at least. Uh, and it wraps it in OK error, which means that I can uh, combine all the pattern matching down here and you just wrap it slash prefix it with OK error in order for you to be able to match on both. And this men is even, oh, this, this is glorious. Just look at this beauty. This is the stuff you want to avoid by writing it more like this. This flat, lovely code. So good. And I've seen this in like real code at work, uh, this huge nesting, which because we don't have with statement, we can't unnest. Okay. Maybe I should start with questions. Are there any questions? No, not any questions. No questions. People are all on to you. They totally understand you. They want mm -hmm. more of your fun -y jokes. <laughs> 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 oh, lovely. Uh, I've documented a lot of this in Edoc, by the way. So uh, I didn't show you that, but if you actually go to Merlin here, like most, if not all, of the functions, at least the public ones, should be. Uh, um, let's see. Yeah. So here's a doc some documentation. Uh, oops. Here's um, some more documentation that try to explain what this does. Yeah. Um. Rebox rear shell. Yeah, start a shell. Um, the the macro, the Q macro, it, uh, you can actually call it in the terminal and see what the syntax looks like. So if you have a tuple that looks like this, 
this is what it actually looks like in uh, what the inside looks like. And in this case, they're all going to be one because it's going to be on line one. It defaults to that. But you see, it's a tuple. The first is an atom, and then it's a variable called foo. Here. Okay, it's foo of. Okay. Okay. And like that, you get a case instead. It looks like this. This is really good, and it's really powerful and really nice. Of course, we don't have variable expansion in, in the shell, so I can't show you this using the actual syntax like this. But the queue here, this is the same as this. Uh, it also adds the line, so it can give the better error reporting, but uh, otherwise it's, it's the same. Yeah. I think I'm good then. If there's no, it's no, no questions? Really? You got yeah. all that? That yeah. fast? They should all start working at Kivra. They all know this stuff yes. already. Yes. No, seriously though, it's really fun at Kivra. We have an awesome time, a lot of Erlang. It's lovely. And some Python. Yeah, well, I'm going to ask the same question to you. Do you need to know any Erlang before starting at Kivra? Or will you learn no. all the Erlang? Yes. Uh, most Arab people actually haven't uh, written Erlang before they start. Um, yeah. Most have come from Java. And so you, we are, do not expect you to be up and running for you know, a couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, if you get fast on that, great. If it doesn't, it's fine. It's OK. Mm. Erlang is nicer than Scala, though, because it's, uh, it's much easier to understand because it's uh, strictly evaluated from top to bottom. It's a dark little, you know, it feels more imperative. Mm. It does. I can kind of agree with you there, actually. Yeah. I have another question, Max. Yes. This is your second time you're speaking or presenting. Yes. How is it to present? Fun. It, it's a bit weird when it's completely quiet and only two people here. It's mm -hmm. much easier when you have an actual crowd. But it's fun. It's so nice. And yes. you can, of course, just do some live coding like this. Or you can make a nice presentation. Yeah. Or have very silly animation as I did last time. We love that. Yes, have people offered you free coffee at the job now, after presenting? Or have some bad stuff well, happened to you? <laughs> I work from home because of the pandemic, so I haven't <laughs> even been to the office. Yeah, so you're waiting for that, people yeah. coming up to you. That was like the best presentation or the worst presentation? I know that uh, my boss, she saw this and she liked that I showed this. <laughs> so you did something right at yes, least. I did Good. Yeah. <laughs> then I'm going to ask the same question to Bjorn. Um, so, how was it to present? Was it good? Would you recommend yeah. others to present? Definitely. No, but it was fun. Um, and once again, sorry for forgetting to present my deck from the beginning. I will not make that mistake twice. <laughs> uh, no, but it, it was really fun. Uh, and uh, good, good way of sort of getting more savvy at presenting. So, it's yeah. great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, with that, I'm going to end. Uh, I don't know if my slide shows or not. I have an issue with my laptop. Anyway, we have two more meetups coming up in the spring. One is in the fourth meetup will be in April 28th. And then we have the fifth meetup in May, 25th of May. Then I'm looking at a meetup in June also depends. But in June, people seem to be very busy all the time. So we'll see. It's also very dependent on that we find speakers or people that actually wants to present. So that's why I really like that you said it's no dangerous no hassle to speak it's really fun to present here yes. yeah uh with that said i uh, don't have anything more do you have anything more max no Jörn, do you want to add something i'm no? good thank you you're good thank you then again i want to give an applause for the presenters thank you very much for coming and presenting there this would be nothing without anyone presenting so thank you very much with that said, have a nice evening, everyone, and see you next time. Bye. Bye.